Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Faith and Culture. We're digging into folks that have faith, obviously, but also how they implement it in the culture. And we have various guests, including our own staff members, because we want you to get to know our staff and our team at deeper and deeper levels. And today we have the world famous Tylene Howarder with us. Tylene, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Dr. McCarty. Uh, Tylene, it is great having you with us. Thank and you. so what we're going to be doing is, okay. I, first of all, I want to ask about your faith journey growing awesome. up and kind of that journey that led you to faith. And so start with that. Tell us about that a little bit. Okay. So I was raised about two hours away from here, outskirts of LA area, uh, Monrovia, Pasadena to be specific. Uh, both my parents, they didn't come from a faith background. Um, my grandma is from Germany and came over in World War II with my grandpa, who was a soldier. Um, and so they came here, didn't really have a faith um, for my dad. Um, and then same with my mom. She didn't really have any kind of faith growing up. And it wasn't until I was born, um, I have an older sister, they started going to church uh, when I was about two, but they actually found the Lord through an Amway convention. Through an Amway so convention. Oh, tell weird. me the story. Just Amway. Amway. Oh, come on. I know, of all things. And community, so, right? There's community there. there there's community. Yeah, okay. They did, and they were looking for something to be a part yeah. of. And it was at an Amway convention that they found the Lord. And so they decided to look for a church. And at first, we got invited to the Mormon church um, by our neighbor. And they didn't really understand all the differences. So they that's actually my first memory of going to a church. It was a Mormon church. Mormon church. Wow. Get and our episode on Mormonism on episode one, Faith and Culture. Yes. And so then um, my dad was looking around and... Uh, saw Robert Schuler's church, oh, yeah, yeah. and we were about 45 minutes away from that in Orange County, which it doesn't exist anymore, but they started going there, and Crystal um, Cathedral, Crystal right? Cathedral. Yeah. yes, Robert Schuler. so that's kind of where we started going, and it was about my junior year in high school that wanted to have something a little bit closer, okay. uh, closer to home, and so I got invited to a youth group in Pasadena, at your first church of the Pasadena, first church? Nazarene. Uh, Nazarene. Yeah. Yeah. And... That was a thriving church back, I don't know what it's doing today, but back It the day, was wow. then. I don't think so now, yeah. but it definitely was then. And so that's kind of where Paz-Naz. I... Paznaz. Was it Paznaz? Paznaz. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was a great place. Yeah. So that's where I... Um, kind of my introduction a little bit more to that personal relationship of who Jesus is and who mm. Jesus was. So and youth so group. Youth, group. youth group, but yeah, you were wild. If we back up a little bit, <laughs> <laughs> back up a little bit. Um, my mom, she was really passionate about staying home and my dad, he was a salesman. We did not have a lot of money. And so we lived in my grandma's house, which was in a very nice area of Monrovia. However, if you can only imagine, we were those people that probably everyone dreads in their neighborhood that um, really just didn't have a whole lot of money in a nice neighborhood with really horrible cars. Yeah. And so it was this um, world-shaping kind of experience for me actually growing up in that because I never was really accepted right there. And so because of that... I just uh, realized there was a lot of a lot of rejection there. A lot of the neighbors because we didn't have the they hated our cars, yeah. and we just couldn't do anything about it. And so um, my parents got me involved in martial arts, and that's pretty much before church what saved me. Wow. Um, martial arts was something that I lived and breathed uh, starting from 13. That discipline, that mm -hmm. honor, respect. Mm -hmm. It taught me so many life lessons um, and just the discipline alone. And so I just craved that community. I craved people that accepted me. Um, we wore uniforms, so no one knew if I had money or not. And it was there where we brought in a lot of kids from um, rougher neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And my, we call him sensei, which is teacher in Japanese. Yeah, um, I watched Karate Kid. I know what you're talking you about. You know Karate Kid. I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. And so, yes, and say, yes, and say. <laughs> and so, it was there that I kind of got 
involved with a lot of kids, I guess you would say, on the other side of the tracks. Um, in a lot of scenarios, I was only the white girl for miles, and I was very comfortable in that. Mm. And it taught me a lot. And it was one of those things where I had this decision to make. I knew God had a calling on my life. Um, or I sensed there was this inner... I, I knew right from wrong. I knew um, that there was something bigger, but I didn't have that like deep connection with God at that point. And so when I was with the friend, my friends that maybe weren't doing the greatest things, I was always pretty straight and narrow. Um, I was always the one who didn't drink. I was always the one who was the shoulder to cry on. Um, and I, but they were my friends and they were in gangs, um, some of them, not all of them. But it helped me understand that world of why they wanted to be a part of gangs is because they wanted so deeply to have connection. Yeah. And I think that's where I wanted so deeply to have connection. And they didn't care about my, my upbringing. They also had a really hard family upbringing, We're way worse than anything I've ever been through. Um, and it just helped me experience the world at a total different lens. And so when I got back to getting invited to church, um, it was one of those things where the youth pastor there, he noticed me because I looked a little different. I was a white girl in very baggy mm. things or, or inappropriate things or whatever I was at that time. I didn't quite look like all the other kids. Mm. And um, instead of this judgment, instead of why are you here, it was let me take you in, and him and his wife. Um, it was one of the most beautiful things that I've ever experienced in my whole entire life, and one person really can change your life forever, mm. and that is truly the experience that I got through that, and I pray it could always be that to someone. So so those are kind of known here when we talk about is leave your gang days. Right? Gang you, days, you, you had to I know. Gangsta. And so what was some of those experiences? I mean, you didn't... Uh, you didn't necessarily spend a lot of time in jail, maybe a little bit of time in jail. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> but that was something that kind of opened your eyes to culture in different ways. And then, so take me into this experience in church. And who is that youth pastor and their, their, their family? Yeah, it's Jim Morwood okay. and Julie. Yeah. Um, we call him Woody. And, he was here, um, right? He was on staff here. Yeah. He was the college pastor for quite some time. Back in the day. Yeah, and then he went to become a campus pastor mm -hmm. um, at Azusa Pacific University, and then he's now a pastor at another church. Yeah. And so, but they were... Um, yeah, I, I don't even know how to describe just what it meant to be received in a church and accepted. And I didn't have, um, at that point, I had made a decision of either, a lot of my friends stopped coming to church. And so I had the choice because I was the one inviting them. Um, and my boyfriend at the time, he was a part of a gang and um, he, we had broken up and he went his kind of own way. Um, and then there was two other friends from martial arts that I was bringing, but they kind of decided they were not sure about church. So I had that decision if I was going to be by myself and go to church or if I was just going to stop going as well. And so I, you're not supposed to test the Lord, but I do vividly remember one night I was like, okay, God, I'm going to go to church. I don't really want to be by myself. And will you just have one person come up to me and say hi? Mm -hmm. Someone outside of Woody and Julie. And it happened to be, like, in the middle of service. And we're, uh, it was a freshman, and I was a junior. And they came up and were so warm and welcoming. Um, and it's something that I will always remember. I will never forget. It will always be a staple in my life of that was the time where I was like, okay, I don't care what it's going to take. I'm just going to keep going. And I did. And that's when I asked, um, or I got asked to intern. And so I started asking, like, hey, can I do anything? Can I clean closets? Can I? You're how old right now? I was a junior. You're a junior, you said. Okay, yeah. got you. And so I just wanted anything to feel purposeful and not feel alone or something that I was giving yeah. to the church and learn. And so that's when I started doing that, and they started asking me to um, 
to cook for their surf camp. And so I was... Did you know how to cook at that point? Um, or were you just like, all right, I'll I do did. it? I did. I like cooking. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not for that many people. It was like 200 kids. Wow. Throw and hot dogs on the grill. What'd it, you do? It, What'd no, you cook? It, we cook good food. Goulash? What'd you do? We had like marinated chicken. <laughs> Come on. And like wow. rice and oh, like a really good salad. There you go. Okay. And I mean, we it was good stuff. <laughs> and so... Ended up doing that for that, for the missions trips to Mexico, um, then started helping organi- organize everything. And that was like my baby kind of like tester of like, okay, God, maybe maybe you're calling me into ministry. Yeah. I'm not 100% sure. But if I am, I want it, I want to be for someone else that I desperately, desperately wanted. And uh, my experience with Woody and Julie they brought me into their house. I'd babysit their kids. I was able to watch how they raised their kids, how they parented, how their marriage was. And my parents, they had a great marriage, um, but they were late coming in to know the Lord. Mm-hmm. And so they were still trying to figure out like who Jesus was and all of those things in raising me. And so it was this beautiful thing to be able to watch this healthy relationship and for me to even today, go back to them and ask questions and yeah. this or that. Woody married uh, my husband and I, and um, yeah, it was a really beautiful thing. What so. uh, did they lead you to the Lord, or were you did you accept the Lord in a church service, or how did that all go? Um, did they kind of walk you through it, or how I that? was pretty young when I technically okay mm-hmm. it, yeah at Crystal Cathedral. Okay. Uh, in primary Sunday school class yeah. at age four or something yeah, yeah. like that. <laughs> and so I don't have that exact memory yeah. of that experience. Um, my experience that I feel like was my genuine, okay, God, I'm giving my life over to you, was like my junior year. Yeah. when I, And that was by myself um, in my room and probably very broken at the time and had – knew I had big decisions to make of who I was going to be and who I was going to hang out with. And it could potentially be a lonely journey if I decided to go in that direction. Now, did you get your black belt? Did I understand that? I got my black belt at 16. At 16. Yes. Nice job. That's, yes. that's really good. And you, have you um, had to fight people? Oh, yeah. 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 Like, what about at church recently? No, <laughs> yeah, church recently. <laughs> but I've never been in a... Like street fight. Yeah, but you're ready you know? if you if you. But I had did to. I I did tell a girl my senior year because she stole my pager. Ooh, to... pagers! Those were <laughs> you didn't mess with people's pagers. You did not you mess did with people's pagers. Were... <laughs> and you know I had to work for everything. I started like working at a very young age, and that was my own money that I bought that pager with. So deal. it was a big deal. I couldn't afford to get another one. Oh. That's a big deal. So Dang, sometimes you gotta had, fight for your pages. You had to fight for <laughs> these things. Do what you gotta do. So you're up in Monrovia area, yeah. Paznaz. What? How did you get down here? Maybe, maybe take me on the journey okay. there of coming to San Diego. Okay, coming to San Diego. So I, when I graduated, I was teaching martial arts. And graduated from high school. Graduated from high school. Okay. And I was deciding of what path I was going to be going. I knew I was either potentially called to ministry. Um, two, I wanted to be a police officer. Mm-hmm. And so I wasn't sure if that was the direction to go or um, open up a martial arts studio. So those were the directions that I was trying to decide and felt like uh, my sister had come to San Diego Christian College uh, for she was a pilot, um, so she got oh, her aviation right. degree at San Diego Christian College. She loved it. She was the first um, girl to graduate with an aviation degree from San Diego Christian College, and so um, she had a great time there, and so I decided I was going to check it out. So I did. I came down, and um, I what fell in love. This? I remember the story. This was when like, she graduated or when she? No, when you came down. I am um, 99. 99, you came down, so... But I started... Yeah, end of 99? You started in 2000? 2000, when did you start? I think. Oh, because we were just... Grad- Chad yeah. and I had just graduated. 2000. We graduated in 99. Okay. Yeah, okay. We got a story about that, too, but go ahead. Oh, we do. Yeah. <laughs> we do. 
Yeah, so I looked into it, and it was one of those things where I was like, okay, I'm going to give this a shot. And um, they had a Bible degree in youth ministry, and so I decided to pursue biblical studies with an emphasis in youth ministry. That's amazing. So that's how I got here. See, folks, San Diego Christian Colleges, San Diego Christian College produces great people. Yes, they do. Sign up now. (laughs) SDCC.edu. It was a great school. So great school. Yeah, I mean, we obviously had an incredible experience. Now, who was your cross-country coach? Oh, boy. Didn't you have a cross-country coach? Okay, so this is the funny thing. Okay, I, I told you before, we didn't have a lot of money. And so I had to find any way possible to pay for college. Yeah. And so I signed up for every <laughs> single sport that they would allow you just sign up yeah, for. Yeah, Which, there was a lot of startup sports. Cross-country was one of them. Mm. And happened to have the most amazing coach, Bickley. Chad Bickley. Chad Bickley as my cross-country which, coach. So funny. Which he does not remember my name. Yeah, I didn't remember. <laughs> You're on team. But That's how good I was. What's funny, you know, what's funny about that, too, is he's coaching because he's trying to get, you know, just like you were trying to get, like, scholarship money, whatever, yeah, to make yeah. it work. Well, he was coaching <laughs> basketball. He was assistant coach at the time at Santa Christian. Mm-hmm. But they had to try to coach other things. Yeah. Just to try to make ends meet, you know, when yes. you're small struggle in Christian college. Yeah. And so it's just hilarious to, to hear that story when you told me he was he was your cross country coach. He was like, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I know. It shows you how much he paid attention back then. But, I know. You know. It's so fun. So okay, so you're at San Diego Christian, you get your degree. I do. And what happens after that? Well, so you've mentioned multiple times that an invite can save a life, and that is so true for me. Even though I was a Christian, um, I needed a church. I needed a body of believers to connect with. And um, I was walking down the hallway one time, and um, this guy, Brandon, um, invited me and my best friend. I didn't know she was going to be my best friend at the time, but she's now my best friend. And he invited us. And he's like, you know, I've got a church, and it's off of Hamishaw. And would love for you guys to check it out. His name is Skyline. And so me and my best friend decided, okay, we're going to come check it out. He was a cute boy, you know, <laughs> and that's always helpful as well. Um, and then we couldn't find the place <laughs> because what? we were looking for Jamaica. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, everyone gets the name wrong. And anyway, so we ended up, though, the following week finding Skyline and um, really never turned back. Mm. And so, um, and it's been 25 years of attending, 20, 24, 25 years of attending. Being part, yeah. Yeah, being a part. And so, so you you were, uh, at that stage, you would have been college age. College age. And so then uh, you went to services. And then when did you start getting involved? Almost right away. Okay. Yeah. What would you sign up for? Did you sign some up for youth. something? So you signed up, hey, I yeah. want to youth or I can't yeah. or whatever. I just said, you know, if you guys have a youth group, mm-hmm. I'm in college, but I'd love to serve. And love to lead a small group if you have that or, I don't know, clean closets, whatever you want me to do. Uh, and yeah. so um, it was Charlie mm-hmm. was the youth pastor at the time. And so, you know, we were able to attend service and then – um, at that time, it was an off-site. It was just down the street where the youth ministry Zero, was at right? Ground, was Zero. Yeah, Ground Zero. Epic Ground Zero. Yeah, the Bank of America. And, now, you know, and he'll always say those were good days, and they were good they were, days, yeah. really good days. We had just – there was an amazing youth group. Um, the team who, at that time, um, the leaders were just incredible incredible, so engaged and involved, and it was just thriving. Yeah. And so it was something that I was so excited to be a part of, and it was a whole bunch of young adult leaders, too, and they had, you know, adult leaders as well. But it was just a – it created community not only for myself, but also being able to invest um, in leaders and so – and or students yeah. who today – are now leaders for me. That's so cool. And so it's just the coolest turnaround, but it was an incredible experience, and that's getting involved right away. Yeah, and out of that, you met someone pretty important, right? I did, yeah. So tell, tell us about that journey, because that's something that's very um, interesting. People don't realize when you get involved in church, if you're single, you get guaranteed a spouse. Guaranteed a spouse. <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> There was, it wasn't the guy who invited us to church, but there was another guy who was super cute. 
um, who was also serving in the youth ministry. And um, was his he name serving was before you, or were you serving? No, I was. Mm, we almost that, came that almost at the same time. Okay, so let's, because we both came around. All, I might have come a little bit before, and mm-hmm. then he showed up. And I think it was October when he showed up. Okay. Yeah. Did okay. So how did that go? Did you guys? So at first, I just like, oh, you're a preppy white guy. I don't think you're going to like me. He was. John. He was. <laughs> he was like rugby player and, uh, you know, had the fancy brand new truck. And I'm like driving up in my beater truck, uh, you know, or beater car that I had. And I was like, eh. But I don't know. We just became friends. We served together for three years oh, wow. before we dated. And then um, Charlie was like, what are you guys doing? Like... It's about time you guys, you know, figure this out. And so we knew each other so well at that time. We kind of knew once we started dating that this was probably going to go in that yeah. the direction of marriage. And so um, we dated for seven months and got engaged and got married seven months after that. Wow. Okay, tell us about your family now. Yeah, so I've been married. Um, going to be 20 years come in October. We're going to go somewhere tropical. Um I, I, I don't know exact location yet, but we are going to go and celebrate. It's a big one. 20 years is a big one, and I think that's something you definitely are going to want to put that little stake in the ground of we went here on our 20th Amen. and then our 25th, that kind of thing. So that would be cool. Be really Absolutely. Exciting, Absolutely. Um, okay, so tell us about the rest of your family. So you guys yes. have married uh, coming up on 20 years, 20 and years. who else and is And so involved? then we've got an 18-year-old son, Logan, and who we just took to college. And so that's been a little bit of a new journey for in us Kentucky. in Kentucky. Yeah, he got a bass fishing scholarship, which is pretty fun. Uh, that's really cool because how many bass fishing scholarship kids come out of, you know, San Diego? You Not don't very hear many. about bass fishing from the South. Yeah, yeah. Because you can watch it on ESPN five. Yes. In the South or whatever channel yeah. it's on now, but you watch it and it's it's amazing that that is a whole culture. Oh, complete, and it's huge. Completely. It's humongous out there. It's huge. And so getting a a, a a young man from San Diego to get a scholarship to go out in the South to fish, I mean, people don't realize that is. <laughs> That's incredible. His dedication, his like abilities and gifts yeah, to be able to yeah. get a scholarship for it's that. It's pretty special. Really, really We're, special. And how was it for mama dropping dropping oldest son off at college? Yeah, it was rough. <laughs> yeah. It was hard. Yeah. You go through all the questions of did you prepare them? Are they yeah. gonna make the right choices? Are they gonna make you know, friends, are they going to get community, the same kind of community that I desired when I came here to San Diego not knowing anyone? And so you, you go through all those questions. And so, but he's doing really well. Um, and we're, we're very proud of him. Good. And so, and then we've got a daughter. She's 16. Um, and she loves Jesus, uh, loves worship and serving here at the church. And um, we don't know where she's going to go to college, yeah. but she's looking into places right now. And then we've got um, a son, our youngest, he's 13. And he just started taco football for the very first time. Oh, boy. And he's little, so yeah. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> There's a lot of learning curves. Oh, that's awesome. So he's playing Pop Warner? He is. Uh, where's he playing? Yeah, at the Titans right here in Rancho San Diego. Nice. Yeah. So what he's position? he's a Is running he back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Still running back. I yeah. love it. He's done soccer his whole life, and so this is – so he's good with sure. the running game, yeah. But um, the tackle game is a whole other world. So That's it's good. It's good. That's fantastic. Yeah. Tell us about your role here. Like, to, what are you doing here? And uh, well, first of all, how long have you been on staff here? Let's start with that. Been on staff for I just had my twenty year mark, and so uh, do you want me to go into my positions moving into yeah yeah so let's talk about the different roles you've had okay I think even for people that are out there that kind of wonder about ministry and you know what what is it like and you've been through all of it I mean 20 years you were part-time you were doing this you were doing that you've always been versatile to be able to just pick up this or pick up that so just yeah talk us through a little bit of those roles that you've had over the years and kind of what that's led to now yeah absolutely I finished, got my Bible degree, and when I was, uh, uh, right before I graduated, I got hired here. 
Um, and so I was part-time, and then as soon as I graduated, I went full-time. Um, and I was an admin for Woody, who was my high school pastor, who kind of led me into the direction, um, the path of ministry. He followed ministry. Charlie, right? He, well, Did he, follow Charlie he was or? the young adult pastor. Oh, that's right, that's right. Was yeah, so Charlie yeah, was yeah. still I here. Mm -hmm. And so there wasn't a position in the youth. And so um, the young adult, we, there was a position that opened up. And so he, we had been doing ministry forever together. And so it worked out just beautifully. And so, but I was his admin technically, but just partnered in ministry with yeah. him a lot and with um, working with a lot of the female leaders and anything that was needed at the time. And so that transitioned into about three years later, he left to go uh, to Azusa. And so there was a position that needed help with the youth and young adult and middle school for discipleship. So I ended up kind of moving into that role of helping develop um, like a small group strategy for our youth. And so did that for five years or so, and then um, ended up transitioning. I got asked to be the small groups pastor at that time in 2009, hmm. and then came on pastoral staff. Um, and then between that, I've done small groups, young adults, youth, um, but then kind of focused in on small groups and women's. And now I'm doing women's and then have oversight for um, other ministries yeah. and also connections, which is more baptism and uh, membership. And so you're doing that, you're doing all the different ministry stuff. And I think when people are getting involved in ministry and thinking about ministry, sometimes we have a specific thing in mind. We're looking at, I'm going to do this and this yeah. is my area. And I think it's a good reminder that, you know, if your heart is willing and just, hey, I just want to serve, I'll do yeah. whatever. And you start with that. And then God just guides you into your niche. Because it feels like, to me, you're in your niche. Like, you're in a really good spot of what you like to do. Yes. And correct me if I'm wrong. But Absolutely. what you like to do, and you're really thriving in that. Are you feeling like you're in your passion? I am. Yeah. And I do. Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel like the experiences of my childhood and yeah. all the way through um, – getting involved in a church and then at Paznaz and then here, just the experience of working with people and all different types of people have yeah. really helped me. And then also through the different departments that I was a part of, and I was an admin for almost 10 years. Yeah. And so when you, ha I feel like that's been a really huge benefit to me mm -hmm. because I'm able to see not only all those 10 years of what it was like, as an admin and how I want to be communicated to now being pastoral staff, how I communicate to my yeah. admin. And um, it's just a gift actually getting to learn all those different skills. And so what was the question? Yeah. No, just in, you're in your passion. Oh, I'm in my passion. Yeah. yeah. And so I love people yeah. and I never want to count anybody out yeah. how they look or who they are, and you never know, like, what is underneath them. Yeah. Because it's just, it was just such a gift that someone saw, you know, something in me. Yeah. And so there's always that person that you think, you know, maybe there's not much there to them, and then you're like, oh, my goodness, there's a hidden gem there. And you and just want to pull that does out. Does it take you back to when you, you kind of prayed that prayer, you know, Lord, have someone... Say yes. hi to me or whatever, yes. right? And then that always stays in your mind because there's that person. And I know when I'm preaching, every Sunday there's somebody there. There's usually multiple people. That is their first time. It's their first time. And it's like they're, they're a little intimidated, a little scared, a little concerned. like, uh. And so I imagine that is on your mind when you see someone that you haven't seen before. You go, you're not afraid to go right up to them. 100%. And welcome them in. Yeah, it means so much to them. And something, you know, that we've incorporated even recently is making a phone call that first day that we see them. And we've noticed what a difference that's made and how shocked they are at how big our church is, but how small it is at the yeah. same time. Yeah. And that is our goal. That is our 100% goal. You know, we, we do we have these, this amazing building and we have all these beautiful resources and an amazing uh, staff but 
it's so cool because the staff knows, like, even though it's big, we know when someone's brand new. Yeah. And um, just how we approach that is something that we all value a lot because of the experiences that we've had. Totally. So Totally. And it's it shows that, like you said, I mean, we're, we're big, but we care. You know, we care, we a care lot. about every single person. You Absolutely. Know, when we say stuff like, you matter to God, you matter to us, we mean it. Yeah. <laughs> we absolutely mean it. And Completely. It's really really a blessing having you on the team you've been here a long time but it's like it's you're you're energetic you're you know you're fresh in terms of it's not like oh i've been here so long i'm doing ministry it's like you're going after it and i love that you know and i see you on sunday in the lobby and i'm pointing people to you like always because i know how you're going to welcome them and how you're going to get them connected if they want to get connected and that's such a huge value you know, even me as as the lead pastor to, to know I can I can talk with someone and I can also give them over to someone that I know they're going to be taken care of, yeah. you know, and we're going to get them plugged mm. in. And I'm so excited about that. I get so thrilled about that. OK, let me ask you some some other questions okay. about just other stuff. Okay. OK, so tell me <clears throat> how has how has failure or apparent failure mm. set you up? For later success, have do you have a favorite failure? A favorite failure, I do. <laughs> um, this one, yeah, I do. Um, this one's been a little bit harder because I don't want to talk about it that much. But when I was pretty young, I was homeschooled. I don't know if okay. I shared that at all. I no, didn't go didn't. to traditional school until yeah. I was a junior. Lots happened wow. when I was a junior. Yeah, that's a quite a year. Lots happened then. Um, but one of the reasons why is because I had a very significant um, learning disability with, uh, called it word blindness, but I couldn't read. And so it was, it was a really tough thing. Yeah. Like really tough. And so um, I had to fake my way through most everything as a child. Um, How, that's before really that's really before just downloading audiobooks so you didn't have anything you didn't you even nothing. have spell check you had nothing and so um embarrassment was a huge thing for me like massive yeah, that'd be tough, that'd <laughs> yeah. Be. and so I memorized a lot of things like I could still figure figure it out okay. and we didn't have all the understandings of dyslexia of all the different things and my mom, um, she she tried to help in any way she could, but I just kind of pretended that I could, and so I didn't get the help I needed okay. because I was so embarrassed by it. Yeah. And so it would just take me a long, long time um, to do any homework, to do any, I'd memorize my spelling test words, so no one found out um, because I spent hours and hours and hours just rewriting something and wow. to not wow. let anyone find out. <laughs> um, and this went on for a very long time um, before I was able to, m my, your brain, it just connects sometimes at different yeah. times. And so it's not a problem now. I'm slower at reading, but that's why I listen to audio over and over and over. And I listen, okay. I love books. I love learning. Um, it's one of my favorite things in the entire world. But that would probably be my most significant um, thing in life that has shaped me of mm. having to figure out how to think outside of the box yeah. to either almost trick people that I was able to get through school, get through tests, get through um, hide tests so my parents wouldn't find them. Um, wow. And yeah. it wasn't until probably college that I really got it nailed down and I would still just go to my room and what took someone else 20 minutes to study it took me four hours and um but I was committed to it yeah you and got so, through not only that you graduated high school or graduate college I mean that's, oh yeah you know just working your tail off yeah. yes I was very committed to it and praise the lord that <laughs> everything's fine but that was a that was that's a big one that was a hard one so uh what advice would you give a smart, driven mm. college student about to enter the real world. 
what advice would you give them, and then what advice would you tell them to ignore? Let's start with the advice you would give. You tell, you give them. What I would give them is try something, like go after something, whether it be a sport you're not good at, um, whether it be learning an instrument, something that's going to challenge them that's not going to come easy for them, mm. that they have to push through, that they're going to have to, whether they like it or not, get up and do it, um, where they have to set a goal. And it's going to be a very hard challenge mm-hmm. in order to get through. Mm-hmm. Um, the other would be put yourself in positions to where you might be ridiculed, you might be challenged, you might not be liked, um, and practice that art <laughs> of have in 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 all the good things of that. Um, but it's so I'm, I've realized that muscle of being able to have thick skin, of having to work through things and not give up and have that determination, um, it it feels like it's lacking. And so I feel like, you know, it's like the gift of imperfection and that gift of of struggle, it, it really is a gift because it grows that muscle that you can't learn right away. It just takes time. And so putting yourself in those kind of positions, I, I think, is really good for for someone. Yeah, in our culture today, it's just it seems like everyone wants to avoid those things, right? You want to avoid it, and so they they avoid it. You know, it might be avoiding criticism, trying to avoid failure, trying yeah. to avoid, avoid, avoid. Yeah. And even, you know, we teach our kids, you're going to get criticized in life, and you have to learn how to take it. And right now in our culture, it seems someone gets criticized and they immediately, it's this defensive mode. They don't know how to take it. And so everyone's a victim and everything. Oh, why me? And it's like, no, we got to teach our kids more. Put, put yourself in tough position. Understand how thick skin, soft heart, all that stuff yeah. is so, so important that's missing in our culture now. Yes, it's, it's huge. And so in different situations that I've had where I've, Felt like I needed I needed that challenge. Um, you know, I decided I was going to train for a marathon. You know, because I knew that was going to take longevity and it wasn't going to happen overnight. Yeah. And it was going to be hard, and I wasn't going to want to do it. And so, and the other was conquering a fear of um, heights. And so I did half dome, and it was terrifying, <laughs> absolutely terrifying. And I will never do it again. Yeah, but However, you did it. but I Broke did it. Through. Yeah. And it was almost like that, um, like stake in the ground. Yeah. And so, doing hard things. Wow. It's, to me, it's, I really want to push my kids in that. Okay, last question for you. Yes. What, what's some bad advice you've gotten in ministry? Because you've been in ministry 20 years. What's some bad advice you got over the years? Well, the bad advice that I got was that it's lonely at the top. Mm. And not that I'm anywhere close to the top, but I've um, been in ministry a long time. and you lead ministries. Lead there, different yeah. ministries, and that is absolutely not true. <laughs> um, it's up to us. Mm-hmm. whether we want to be lonely or not. Um, we have the option to open up to people and to invite them into our life. And by no means would I say you should invite everybody into your life, by no means. But there are people that you can't... It, I feel like if you've done it right in building relationships over the years, there's going to be maybe it's just one or two people Um but we don't need this massive amount. And so if you have just like those few people, um, my husband and I have always been a part of a small group, uh, I want to say for the last 20 years. And that has meant everything to us. And not that we share everything with everyone in the group, but we have our solid few. And um, sometimes ministry can be lonely and days can be lonely, but we've we've chosen to open up to people and bring them and invite them into our journey and because of that ministry hasn't been as lonely as what i think some have experienced yeah no that's good and that just reminds me too the other thing you're doing is you're also a chaplain for the sheriff's department yes you know and so we need to talk about that for a moment because that's such an important ministry that you're able to provide so how did you get into that and you know how's that going yeah so um, 
you know, back in my, you know, when I was trying to figure out what to do, to do yeah. it was yeah. potentially, you know, going to law enforcement. Yeah. And so this opportunity opened up. We are have an easement with the sheriff station Another that's right just here. right here. Yeah. And every time I'd come up, you know, to work and or to church, and I'd be like, man, I wish we could just have a relationship with them. And I reached out to, you know, the sheriff department, and I was like, hey, I don't know if you do this, and I don't know if this is even a need, but, um, you know, do you have a chaplain program, and is there a need there? And I got a response within, like, 15 minutes. Yeah. And it was the coolest thing because it's a really busy station and they don't always have an opening. There's a team of chaplains, mm -hmm. um, but they didn't have a female chaplain and they need both male and female because there's so many female deputies and yeah. situations and scenarios that are helpful to have both um, there for. And so I went through the process. It's, um, it's similar uh, to getting hired as a actual sheriff outside of you don't go through yeah. the academy. Um, but it's a very long process. Yeah. And so I've been a, uh, officially doing that for about two years now, and it has been the greatest gift and the most beautiful um, kind of God just kind of merging two passions of mine together, of ministry and then law enforcement. And I get to do some really fun things um, along with obviously some very challenging and hard situations that some of our deputies have been in. Um, that's my main responsibility for when a scenario or situation um, or an officer related shooting yeah. or anything that could be traumatizing to a sheriff. Um, the chaplains are there afterwards to be able to support and help them and their families and come alongside them in any way that they need. Yeah, you talk about feeling lonely potentially. You know, after a situation like that, that's such an important element. It's an important it ministry to be able to connect with them and, and help them, pray for them, and be there for them. And we love doing that as a church. We love our sheriffs. We love our law enforcement, first we responders, do. and we'll do everything we can. For yeah. Them. Ty, thank you yeah. for joining us on another me. episode of Faith and Culture. You guys, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time on our next episode of Faith and Culture. God bless you guys. Yeah.